Oh, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the African Studies Association of the United Kingdom. Um, <laughs> Mary Kingsley Zokhanis lecture. This is the second one we're having in this extraordinary year uh, because we've obviously been unable to meet in person. So instead of having in person, one in person talk, we have this year had two talks that have been entirely delivered online. So today I'm, in, I'm delighted to welcome Neo, who will be introduced fully by um, Louisa Ebonike after my short introduction to the seminar. Uh, the, um, the, the seminars, the Zakonis um, seminars have been going on now for more than 10 years, and it's part of a grant that we've been, we were given historically um, by the foundation. Uh, African Studies Association of the United Kingdom is, I guess, the premier organization that has dealings with Africa and re research relationships between Africa uh, amongst Africa-based institutions in the UK, but also increasingly we are linked to, uh, we make links with and are linked to African, institution, African institutions on the continent of Africa. Going forward, we intend to do much more of this um, international activity, both online and in person. But um, for this, this year, again, due to the um, epidemic, we've done a, a number of events, well, particularly the earlier MKZ lecture online. This will continue. Uh, next year, we will be having our um, biennial conference. And after this, we will begin, we will start to market this in the near future. For the time being, um, we welcome you to this seminar and we hope that you will continue to support the activities of ASA UK and join in them as we continue to plan our activities for the coming year. So again, welcome to Neo, and I will now be passing over to Louisa Ebunike, Dr. Ebunike, who will be introducing Neo and the seminar. Enjoy. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar, and we encourage you to start to use the Q&A um, panel once you have questions to ask. Um, so do stay, listen to the lecture, and we look forward to also forwarding your um, Q&As at the end of the session. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Oduki. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, our second Mary Kingsley Zokanis uh, Lecturer of the Year. Um, and... Um, uh, Dr. Neil Poulet is, is someone whose work I've been interested in now for a couple of years. So it's really, really lovely to have her join us in this forum. And let me start by just saying a, a big thank you to Dr. Poulet for the time and effort that goes into preparing um, this kind of a, um, talk and this, for this kind of an event. Um, Dr. Neil Poulet is a registered counselling psychologist with the Health Professions Council of South Africa and holds a PhD in consulting psychology. Her work experience integrates student affairs, counseling and development, leadership consulting, academia, and social dream drawing research. And she'll be speaking a bit more about that this evening. In 2021, she launched the Agile Student Leader of the 21st Century Project as a result of the National Research Foundation Black Academic Advancement Program Award. Through understanding student leadership experiences by means of social dream drawing, Dr. Pule anticipates the South African Student Leadership Competency Framework, which will enable scholarly-based, coherent student leadership development efforts in the country. Her belief that student leaders are leaders of the future is central to her drive towards the pursuit for well-grounded scholarly initiatives towards student leadership development. Dr. Poulet previously received awards from the British Academy in 2018 and currently the British Council Newton Fund Researchers Travel Link Grant. Other previous local and international awards include the award for the most promising young researcher by the National Student Development Association in 2015 and the Emerging Scholar Program hosted in Japan in 2016 during the International Psychology Congress. So without further ado, we will press on to um, hear Dr. Neo's talk. And, and as Professor Duke said, please um, put questions in the chat as, as they come to you as the, as the talk um, goes on. So we look forward to hearing from you all uh, later on. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this event. I'm very excited. Um, I am so excited to share with you to be here. Thank you for the invitation um, to present this lecture. I am very privileged to be a part of the SA UK Lecture Series in 2021. I want to say a special um, acknowledgement to my SA UK collaborator, Dr. Uh, Louisa Ebenika, um, as well as Carly, who's been, you know, background support and tonight uh, making sure that the techs are working with us. So um, my the title of my talk has been mentioned. I'd like to speak to you about decolonizing research methodologies in psychology, student uh, dream drawing studies of um, student leadership context in South Africa. So it is a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you to my home uh, and be your virtual host all the way from my study in South Africa. Uh, one thing that we can appreciate about the horrible pandemic and the fourth industrial revolution is the enabled means to make such things possible. So we are grateful. Um, it is also my pleasure to deliver this lecture uh, during Heritage Month in South Africa ask about um, this task or a, a challenging task about this though, um, while I was in uh, preparation of this lecture was to figure out how to tell an English audience and others joining around the world from different parts of the world about Africa and South Africa in a way that they could connect, understand, and shut a, in such a short space of 45 minutes. Uh, so such a, such a short space of time. There's so much wealth and richness of African knowledges. And I mentioned that in plural um, because um, we don't have just an African knowledge, but in plural, therefore so much to share and to say. While I know in part, I hope that I can familiarize you in some way in order to achieve the goal of the talk in terms of thinking about methodologies. At the same time, um, it became comforting that the SAUK uh, audience are scholars um, who work in Africa. Uh, one of the things um, that made it difficult for me to, to, to do this task um, has, has been the reality of my blended nature. Uh, this comes after following an educational track all the way to doctoral level through Western settings thus conditioning me within Western um, ideologies. Today, however, my aim is to highlight my African part of the blend uh, that may have been silenced along the way that I have grappled um, to locate so that I can be an authentic psychology practitioner, um, academic, lecturer, researcher, who is true to herself in the depth of, of the soul. I invite you on this journey with me to explore what might be a paradigm shift or a journey of discovery or, um, of thinking about um, ideas on research, methodologies, and the manner in which context is paramount when it comes to research practices. I start the lecture by making some assumptions and propositions uh, about research and the researcher. I then go on to introduce myself as a researcher. This introduction is done on the basis of self as instrument where I adopt a belief that my, or why, where I adopt an attitude that my beliefs and wishes shaped the context of the, uh, of the research. You'll probably hear many in contradictions, many tensions, sorting, as I grapple with the topic that I have decided to bring for discussion. This is woven in the portion of the lecture pertaining to African ontology uh, and its vis a vis position to its Western contender or the presentation about my ideas on research that may be sometimes unpopular as they are flavored with pluralism and the fluid perspectives on the researcher's worldview. My position on decoloniality or decolonizing research or methods is shaped by a relational philosophy where knowledge is fluid and dynamic within the relational space. Within this philosophy, I come to know because of our connection, much like the African idiom, I am because you are. This notion allows research uh, where meaning is relative 
As a result, the worldview um, that multiple realities are available to a concept can be foregrounded, uh, much like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This suits me because um, when I want to draw in the African perspective or perspectives into my work, but can be problematic to legitimize um, the ongoing rigid institutional cultures that we operate within. For example, there are two realities in South Africa. The affluent, mostly of white race, who benefited from the apartheid institutionalization and practices, and the 80% majority of the country who till today um, suffer the complexities of economic, social, cultural, and the interconnected forms of exclusion that denies the legitimacy of their knowledges. Some may therefore favor a purist approach in view, in, in order to assert the voice of the marginalized or to maintain the status quo. Tensions may arise between relativism and real, realism if we're looking for single answer solutions and explanations in research. On the one hand, relativism makes space for contextual explanations of research uh, of reality, while realism hones in on the universal nature of being human. Questions of reality uh, or questions of evidence confront me um, as I'm meant to prove truth for my research to be credible or what general article reviewers might say to be valid and reliable. As a researcher, though, I believe that being critical is being ethical and that scientific integrity is an ethical obligation that is achieved through authenticity in research. Regarding methodology, I am pained by what we call scientific and what is not and how globalization, internationalization and academic prestige negate and prefer particular ways of knowledge knowledge construction than others. While busy with the idea of scientific integrity, I will, be a, I will try to be aligned uh, to, the, to the topic of this lecture and to dream a bit and invite you to dream a bit. In this, let me pose the following question. What if knowledge was in you and me at the same time? If we embrace the relational ontology, what is the same knowledge? What if the same knowledge was outside of me, but interconnected with me and you? And what if it was independent of us? If it didn't only exist in our brains, but in our feelings, in our emotions, in the intangible outside of us and the intangible around us? And what if all the parts of the elements that I've mentioned, mentioned were true? In other words, what if knowledge existed in realms beyond what we can prove? What if it was that we only knew that we know and um, because we are connected with the sky in particular ways at a particular time, um, uh, but in different manners at different times? I'm suggesting the idea of being present during research, being present, where sometimes things make sense even though they are unknown to us. At this point, let me introduce African philosophy by sharing a quote from Francis E. Eaton from the article on the ontology of African philosophy. And he says, the nature of the African philosophy therefore refers to the features of, um, in philosophy that give it its peculiar African character. This is found in the African in the African philosophical tra 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 tradition, for philosophy is rooted in tradition. The nature of a philosophy is the tradition of that philosophy. And the tradition of that philosophy is the spirit and the style of that philosophy, the present and dominant orientation of a people's philosophy, which can be seen as primary. To me, Style and spirit is multidimensional and multi-ontological and epistemological and points to the researcher's view, which I would say is a set of uh, basic beliefs that guide one's action in research. These consist of general philosophical inclinations that position um, the nature of the research and how it's foregrounded. This is then how we learn, 
um, about the exist about existence and about being, or how we know or how we don't know. Therefore, um, worldview uh, predetermines or predicts the researcher's views and the positioning of the researcher as a principal investigator, but also the positioning of the participants and the research team. Um, how they gather data, what they do with the data, therefore their methods and their methodologies, ultimately implicating eth uh, ethical research in context. Western influence is well known for individualistic focus, finding and proving the truth, as well as the idea of objectivity. I highlight the notion of the um, African ontology, which is concerned with communalism, significance of meaning and symbolism, as well as the spiritual basis of existence and material. In language, African ontology is rich in proverbs, idioms, and the usage of words. This may have implications for research approaches that are in use today. Francis um, E. E. Kinnam continues to suggest that African philosophy is about seeking the meaning and understanding within the basis or the bias and context of African cultural settings and experience where African philosophy is the reflection of an African or those who are not African on how Africans make sense of the existence and the world in which they live based on the African experience and reality. This is sounding like Gobana Ratele when he titled his text um, on thoughts about African um, psychology, the world looks like this from here. Decoloniality is subjected to controversies, debates and perspectives, therefore indicated by various ways of implementation. Decoloniality or decolonization may bring up issues um, of clash and harmony between Western and African ontology. True to decolonization, I've been tempted so many times to retitle this, um, this lecture, but in any event, I want to say that I take universities as institutions of knowledge production, as many of us may as well. In fact, these are agents of social, economic, and leadership. Therefore, for this very important societal project, Decolonization of universities cannot be escaped. The call uh, for decolonization of knowledge and how we construct knowledge, as well as inst institutional structures pertaining to this by South African university students is rooted in the struggle for social justice, equity and equality. This reminded many about the 1976 revolts that were regarding the Bantu education that ensued in 1960, segregating the then white and non-white educational systems. The onset of, apart the onset of post apartheid in 1994 meant merging and integrating these systems, resulting to marginalized African and indigenous knowledge. Therefore, the decolonization of universities and ultimately methodologies especially in the, South African, um, in the South African context, cannot be separated from the painful and traumatic history, cultural silencing, political turmoil, um, and psychological trauma that is intergenerational. Thus, as academics, we have a social and ethical obligation to be active participants of this project. One question that is important to interrogate is about how um, we might apply African ontology to universities or methodologies, especially where we find Africans. A field like psychology in South Africa, for example, has international status to preserve in an attempt to be part of the global conversation. We understand that. But then simultaneously obligated to approach the client, the patient, the research participant in a manner that facilitates resonant wholeness. Decolonization for psychology as a science has been widely debated. Besides the conversations within the Global South movement led by those such as Maldonado Torres, who bases um, some of his work on the ideas of Franz Fanon, who is a well-known political figure, but, or who's well-known in the political sphere, that's what I meant to say, but a mental health practitioner by profession, 
African psychology has also been entertained. This is an, int this is an interesting movement for me. <laughs> Since not so many countries in Africa recognize the profession, such as of a psychologist. A fact that may be of interest in this regard is that psychologists and those who recognize themselves as psychologists in Africa have organized themselves through the Pan-African Psychology Union, which became a turning point for psychology in Africa in 2017, led by its first, first president, Professor Satsuka. Prominent names in the field of study um, of African psychology includes Professor Bamin Semaneng, Professor Augustine Noe, Professor Kopanaratele. In grappling with African psychology or decolonizing um, psychology as a science, there is the issue of psychology as a social science subject, a medical science issue. In thinking about African psychology or what is African psychology, Kopanaratele suggests four psychologies psychology in Africa cultural African psychology, critical African psychology, and psychological African studies. I will now introduce and speak about a field of work that I have been enthusiastic about as a case study to the point that I'm attempting to make through this lecture. My own research topic and research population is student leadership. Student leadership, especially in the South African context, has played a unique transformative role within the academy, but also within the wider society. It presents differently than in the West, probably due to the social, political, historical, and cultural differences in the context or in the purpose that they need to fulfill. Decolonization of education in South Africa has a clear link to apartheid. The unique role of students and today, student leaders' transformation role was initiated before 1994 uh, through internal requests by student organizations to relieve the apartheid pressure. It is only after 1994, through legislation, that the South African universities were compelled to release their strong arm. It is therefore not surprising that South African um, student leaders um, predominantly um, and are uniquely operated through practices that are linked to the university governance and management. As such, student leaders are required by the Higher Education Act of 1997 to serve as representative in high level decision making structures in, within the universities. While this effort supports co governance, one wonders about issues regarding the leadership burden and the psychological maturity and competence to perform this very important task. However, other forms of student leadership exist outside this legislative arrangement. These are enterprise graduate attribute related student leadership programs which aim to develop students in order to satisfy the corporate demands for leadership ready students or graduates. This sets may be more linked to many of the Western models. There are also those labeled as activists or otherwise called as non-positional leaders. These leaders are those enthusiastic about a cause and usually organize or lead movements. The recent popular of such movements have been the hashtag fallist movements. This event, may have uh, resembled the 1976 events when black students reacted to the injustices of the education system. So 40 years later, student activism, activism reared its head against institutional racism, which, which did not die with apartheid. The Fallers movement may have some international spark to its inception, but just like um, the launch of, 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 of democracy in South Africa, um, that was a result of the responses of the political, social, economic pressures of global reform. Um, however, the movement or the fallist movement cannot be denied its localized edge. The roots of this movement are symptomatic of deep social and economic concerns rooted in apartheid history of South Africa. Born frees are looking for tangible transformation. 
Student leaders are the future leadership of the country and the world. It is my passion for young people in Africa for the world that has propelled me to think about how best we might reach them. Therefore, I contend that caring about the reality, meanings, experiences, etc., of student leadership is in effect uh, caring about future leadership. With the eyes of the globe on Africa in this current stage, there is a call to invest in the leadership of young people in Africa, even for the sake of the world. And I will reference the World Economic Forum on this one. Some of the preoccupations of student leaders are contextualized within generational trauma and injuries of inequalities and social ills that are difficult to confront. And as a result, I have turned to social dream drawing to connect with the unique, deep, and deeply rooted experiences that occur with this group. Decolonizing methodologies requires confronting injustices, giving up power, and surrendering to the unknown. Student leaders are dynamic, adventurous, daring, and robust. Thus, appro uh, appropriate research methodology concerning this context should be stimulating, creative, and inspiring the student leaders to explore their experiences in a way that they can connect with the research practice. Due to the trauma or psychological impact within student leadership in South Africa, research methodologies should also aim to elicit uh, data that can be of a distressing nature without implementing uh, this method uh, or without the implementation of this method being distressing in of itself. Social dream drawing provides student leaders with a container to express their reality. Social Dream Drawing was formulated by Rose Mersky. And I would just uh, take this moment to honor her presence um, in this event and, and, and just express my gratitude um, for her attendance. Um, thank you so much, Rose. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I really do. In Social Dream Drawing, group participants are asked to bring to the data collection session a drawing of their own sleep dream that they would relate to the research topic. Typically, with five or six participants in the group, meaning five or six dream drawings uh, within one session. The assumption based on the associative unconscious is that the preoccupations and associations that are at play within the group dynamic will emerge during the exploration of the research topic through the use of a drawing. The associative unconscious is the interconnections of the group. The dream becomes social when participants make free associations to each of the dreams that are presented in the session and then having a meaning making dialogue to link the free associations with social issues in the group experience. Mersky advises that researchers or facilitators of social dream drawing have an important role during the session to help participants link the dreams one to another and to present hypotheses about the dynamics in the group or the group experience of the social issues that emerge during the session. The drawing provides verbal and visual data to present an account of the lived experiences. So, the verbal data is attained through the description of a dream and the description of a dream drawing, um, as well as the free associations that the group makes to the dream and the dream drawing, um, and the meaning making conversation that follows. Visual data is of course, the drawing of the dream and at times metaphors that may arise when the dream or the dream drawing is explored. The method provides a non-threatening creative playfully spirited environment, as Rose Mersky would say, to explore issues in the lived experiences of the people in the, in the context of group as a whole. So during the data collection session, photographs of the drawings are also captured. And I'll be able to show some of these pictures that I've captured um, with the student leaders that I've been uh, privileged to speak to. So the research project under discussion um, explores the um, experiences of student leaders in South African universities in order to understand their psychological and related experiences. 
This exploration provides insight into their the, the needs for support, but also gives them an avenue to work through these experiences in a way that facilitates connections. The first uh, project was initiated in 2014, and some field work have also been undertaken in 2021. Um, the 2014 project or my, doc my doctoral research involved one university. The 2021-2022 project um, is extended to multiple universities. So due to my psychology roots, my training, and my research interest in student leadership, the project holds many different um, fields and parts of knowledges. Thus, um, can interest different people for various reasons and allowing conversations across fields. So the diagram before us now uh, is a picture that um, I attempt to contain it all. Through this diagram, it becomes evident that student leaders hold and represent a lot for the system. During the social dream drawing, two dream themes stand out um, for this lecture the half face uh, drawings and the dreams about pregnancy. It is important to understand African symbolism um, and meaning when exploring these dreams or their drawings. And I will refer to some as we go through the drawings and show the student leadership themes or issues that are highlighted through these symbols. I show 2014 and 2021 drawings to show how the conversation is progressing through the um, associative um, unconscious over time. So before us, we have a drawing um, of the half phase dream, uh, dream drawing that um, was um, um, in the 2014 project. Um, and then on the other side, a half phase dream drawing that was um, in the 2021 uh, work. Um, and let me add to say it was my recognition of the theme repeating itself um, of, of, of having the drawn a half face from 2014 that I labeled this drawing 2021. But I will speak to um, what the student leaders had been saying about this particular drawing. Um, so my recognition of the themes and um, as I'm looking at the drawings before me, I actually noticed that uh, in 2014 we had seen the left side of the um, the left side of the face, and then in 2021 we've seen the right side of the face. Interesting fact that is a new finding for me. Um, anyway, the half face dream highlighted the idea of appearing faceless. Appearing faceless implies withdrawing from the spotlight potentially an unconscious denial about facing the demands of transformation. Further facelessness could be an unconscious denial um, of the extent of reconciliation already achieved in South Africa. There's been evident rivalry about issues on diversity within the, the student group discussions and the approach used to address these um, issues. The shines of spotlight on trust and mistrust dynamics the group agrees that the intention is to pursue Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African life philosophy that espouses interdependence and solidarity among human beings. The student le leaders describe Ubuntu as a selfless leader who seeks peace and is accommodating, as in the following quotation. So it's being a selfless leader, not thinking about yourself. Putting yourself in any kind of position to, how can I say, to accommodate others. Another student leader said the following, I also get the feeling like old school leadership, like not fighting with guns, um, you know, kind of Mandela stuff. Simultaneously, differences of or split in approaching conflict appear as either a peacemaking displayed as a passive or passive aggression approach or an aggressive or confrontational approach that um, displayed as overt aggression um, at times used to express a sense of agency. Um, and this we see, um, this has also been shown through the half-phase conversation. 
Student leaders end up with an identity crisis. Um, this identity crisis threatened their sense of belonging as students. It is African for leaders to have what is called an ahutra, meaning a community meeting where decisions are made in consensus. Through an ahutra, leaders facilitate a collaborative strategy of leadership and lead together with their followers. The contradictory style of Western models creates confusion where student leaders end up in an identity crisis in which they would like to be one with their constituency, but are torn as a result of their leadership position that clearly creates boundaries between them and their followers. Once student leaders enter student leadership, they are bitten by the snake as in the 2021 Alpha's Dream Joy. In some African symbolism, dreaming of a snake is a representation of pregnancy. The bite of the snake changes their identity, as we see um, in, a, in a, a DNA drawing on, on the one side of the half face um, drawing. And so the students were saying that the bite of the snake changes their, their identity or their DNA. Um, and in one way, the pregnancy changes one's identity because uh, of becoming new, um, like becoming a mom. During the social dream drawing, students associated the snake bite with being muted, ultimately taking away their voice, which had propelled them to take up the student leadership role. Accordingly, one is able to shout the group message, which is, which is, a, a, which is a diluted version of their authentic voice. Challenges and potential resistance to change that is embedded in institutional cultures is shown by the snake bite or in another drawing not shown here where students with student leaders dreamt about being chased by dogs. For one part of society, uh, dogs are a man's best friend. In the apartheid entrenched psyche, dogs are used um, as a threat and a weapon to discipline those who rebel. As a result, Dreaming about dogs can represent the generational trauma and associations of authoritarian structures that avoid collaboration and use cold interactive strategies to get their point across. In the stillbirth dream, the dreamer narrated that she dreamt a scene at a hospital. Her grandmother casually sat and held a drink in her hand. The dreamer saw herself being pregnant. She was shocked and crying as she could not explain how the conception had happened without intercourse. Then there was a blur. She faced a decision either to carry a baby to term or to have an abortion. At the dream's climax, the, dreamers dis the dreamer discovered that she had had a stillbirth. She held the baby in her hands, but the baby was not breathing. She seemed dead. Two dreams relating to the pregnancy or relate, relating to pregnancy came up in 2021. In one dream, the baby was born. The issue came when the father of the child was disappointed because the baby was a girl, not a boy. In the second dream that I show here on the screen, the baby was born. The mom placed the baby in a basket close to the river. A big storm came and there was a big flood. The baby was taken away by the water of the river, never to be found, even after the father called a, um, called a search or a community search for this baby. Student leaders want to leave a mark. Their compulsion to act as leaders who can deliver was indicated by their anxiety to take action with regards to transformation. All three pregnancy dreams speak to the unfruitful effort Fathers hit the home while mothers implement the directions that are set by the father. Mothers are concerned with nurturance and issues of taking care. Mothers were associated uh, by student leaders with the incubation of their visions and aspirations and the warmth provided by a mother through care and support, which participants reflected as being missing from the reality of their student leadership environment. Mothers who are barren, or is unsuccessful at bearing fruit are frowned upon. It is against this backdrop that student leaders associate disappointment to stillbirth or losing the baby as it was taken away by the river. 
The communal aspect resurfaces when the father calls for a community search to find a lost baby. Boy children are given to priority because they are able to carry the family name as well as to keep the land or estate of the family of origin. Thus, issues of continuity come up for student leaders in relation to their effort during uh, the discussion about the disappointment with the birth of the girl child. One new theme is emerging. Psychodynamically, we can say the, draw the drawing shows the female dreamer's wish for a united commun student community. Moreover, showing the dreamer as an integral instrument in the realization of this united state. As a group, however, student leaders associated and reflected um, on, in terms of this drawing on the fantasy about um, reconciliation as being related to the South African society as a whole and them and seeing themselves as playing a significant role in uniting the country. This is a further question regarding the role of women in student or in leadership specifically relating to reconciliation as mothers who hold the knife in its sharp end, as it's on a proverb about women being in the front lines when there is trouble in the family or community. Theoretically, through the associative unconscious, the manifesting dialogue is associated as representing a macrocosm of society. So in the 2014 study, student leaders associated Mandela um, as a leadership symbol for community, living um, with a sense of Ubuntu and achieving reconciliation. It is not surprising that the stillborn dream uh, or in the stillborn dream, the dreamer mentioned to have seen her grandmother in the dream. What is not surprising about this is that elders such as grandmothers happen to be midwives uh, at times and are uh, first or prioritized to be told about the pregnancy. Once elders are accepting of um, one's pregnancy, hope sets in and expectations for the future are set high. Elders therefore have an idealized and authoritative position to give direction. Therefore, um, it would be natural for Mandela as a leadership elder to be idealized or for student leaders to want to follow in his footsteps. However, without tangible transformation, student leaders feel despondent and disappointment in their efforts or in the fruit of Mandela's leadership. The reality concerning the status quo becomes an overwhelming task and the leadership burden leaves them feeling helpless and shameful. Dream work in psychology can be traced back to the work of Collium. The interesting fact is that it has been documented that Jung's contribution on dream work was cemented on his consultation and observation in Africa. Others like Collins in 2009 have criticized Jung for his projections um, of his civilized attitude in terms of this contribution, thus finding his theory problematic in the African context. Dream work, however, remains valuable to Africans. The perspective of Jung emphasizes the mystical, symbolic and significant role of dreams that have, um, that have deep resonance with the African belief system. Jung's fundamental contribution regarding the collective unconscious suggests that the archetype is universal. However, the image ought not to be regarded as such, since the image should be contextualized based on culture, history, and the physical environment. In recent years, um, Susan Long, who became well-known for um, social analytic studies, acknowledges Jung's contribution of the collective unconscious, but, but also notes that, that this is an expression of the individual person. She thus advances this idea by proposing the associative unconscious, a form of the unconscious mental field, or as mentioned before, the interconnections of the group. In her 2017 article, she asserts the following. Social analysis is the study of the group or societal dynamics. 
It is through the person and through interactions between persons that dynamics of the social system can be expressed consciously or unconsciously. The person can be regarded as holding particular aspects of the social system at various times and for various lengths of time, thus personal characteristics of experiences are considered as long-term aspects of the social environment and of relationships with others. In terms of research and RECA, Long notes these aspects that are of interest to me and very important to me. Social analytic research methods in general takes a different stance to research from general social science inquiry. She says the ideas of reliability and validity of research, for example, must be approached from the perspective of system as a whole, rather than the perspective of multiple individuals. The traditional research, for instance, might argue that, the, that for results to be valid and reliable, all individuals in the study should be approached in exactly the same way um, and asked exactly the same questions. This is regarded as standard practice. However, the object of study in social analysis is neither the individual nor, the, nor an aggregate or average. The object of, this, of the study is system as a whole, whether a group, an organization, or society. Potentially concurring with Susan Law, methods such as social dream drawing can help researchers to speak to research participants through an attitude of group as a whole by using the communal perspective. For African people, dreaming is significant because of the wisdom that Africans receive from dreams. Interest, interestingly, the Khoisan, known as the indigenous people of Southern Africa, have a saying that a dream is a dream if it is our dream. Thus, dreams for Africans are intersubjective than subjective. Noe advises that in the African perspective, one can dream for others, and as a result, an individual's dream becomes a source of a message from outside the individual for others, rather than the individual's dream being only from their, for their benefit. In Noe's description of African dream theory, dreams originate from another source to an individual, rather than originating within the individual for individual benefit, but to deliver a message for others. So social dream drawing proposes an opportunity to generate meaning and context in ways that can resonate with African people, given the symbolism and meaning of dreams um, for Africans. So social dream drawing comprises meaning and context through metaphors and, and abstract representations of cultural and historical artifacts. It is hypothesized that social dream drawing is accessible in the space of African psychologies and the collective or associative unconscious. In of itself, social dream drawing is not indigenous. However, what it generates can be indigenous intent that may further the understanding regarding the research topic. Through group process, methods like social dream drawing allows the tapping into the cultural and historical knowledge and thinking that is occurring in the dreaming of a group. Dreaming can be considered as thinking, which is, which is presented by participants in a group process by means of a drawing. Therefore, Noah's statement is consistent with Mersky in terms of the social dimension of dreams. Furthermore, the African dream theory demonstrates the belief and commitment of Africans to the invisible. Noah says, I quote, dreams are often poetic or metaphorical, dense or didactic, or even at times prophetic in content. International research standards and norms persist to be a prerequisite for compliance in order for uh, best practice research that is scientifically accepted as sound and ethical. For rich, thick data about student leadership experiences, student leaders in South Africa, for example, ought to be viewed as co-researchers. The element of the co-researcher is important because of its democratic nature that allows student leaders to be named if they wish to be. Traditional ethical 
um, research protocols prioritize the use of pseudonyms for the sake of anonymity and confidentiality in research. However, due to the function of student leaders in the university system, as I had explained, research participants student leaders may prefer to be named because of the representative value of their contribution to the research. Additionally, student leaders as co-researchers affords them the expert position on their student leadership experience, which is an empowering advantage. This advantage gives student leaders a legitimate voice, removing them from a passive role of a participant who may be forgotten once the research is done and complete. The reviewing of the research participant as a co or the viewing of the research participant as a co-researcher is by nature an African practice based on the communal aspect of the, on, of the African ontology. For research um, that is collected through social drawing, for example, the attitude of the researcher is to approach participants in a manner that is consistent with the norms of, of their being, given that, the, that African relate Give, um, given the way that Africans relate to dreams, and also seeing them as co-constructors of the uh, co-constructors of the findings of the research, social dream drawing or methods that promote resonance to African context should consist of relationship building, participation, collaboration, being present, and ought to be embedded in principles including inclusion social justice, knowledge democracy, shared action leadership, self-directed learning and action, and openness to new ideas, theories, and practices. In an attempt to make full circle to where I started this talk, we need culturally responsive research that, for example, affirms the student leaders' contribution to their own environment and upholds their value and important, or importance as active members of the, of the university community and ultimately the society. As a researcher in the African context, one should pursue human connectedness. In a conference that I recently attended last month, I was greatly inspired by a keynote address delivered by a professor, Itumelen Kumalo, which explored altruism as a key towards human connectedness. This is altruism as a selfless, um, or, or, or as selfless, compassionate, not self-seeking, centered on love and humility, embedded in authenticity, an attitude that we ought to have when thinking about uh, approaching research participants or the data that we gather, analyze, and write about. To this end, I will then conclude the lecture by making a note about ethics um, committees with regards to the effort to decolonize the role they play when looking after confidentiality, anonymity, and the view of the researcher and the research participant, what is ethical um, and what is ethical research in Africa in the global context. Therefore, how their role helps us as African researchers or as researchers who are conducting research that involves Africans to pursue human connectedness. I hope to have stimulated your thinking to entertain the idea of breaking boundaries and being open to new ideas of knowledge construction within what we have regarded as science. The disclaimer is that African knowledge is not new as it has always been there. The idea of new is in how we draw on it as a knowledge system that has been largely excluded from the academy. Africa more than just, exclude, just included as an add-on, but maybe as an equitable contributor to global knowledge, or if I might add, the one who the world listens to for a change. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Pule, again, for such a, a rich and um, interesting talk. I can see in the chat we've already got people singing your praises. Um, I would invite any, any questions uh, that people may have to 
post them in the chat or in the uh, Q and A um, icon at the bottom of the, the Zoom talk. So please, please do post your questions. We've got about just over half an hour for a discussion. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Pulit, is there anything that you would like to um, speak to that maybe didn't make it into the lecture? Um, if not, I can. I, I've got quite a few questions I'd like to to uh, to pose to you. But was there anything anything that sort of um, didn't quite make it into the final cut that you wanted to speak to? Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, or to the Q and A. Uh, I think uh, go on, Doctor. I have um, already imposed a lot. Maybe I will just kick us off with a with a question or two. Um, I can see in the chat people saying that, that this is sort of a new a new subject area for them and for, for many of us who who aren't in the field of psychology. But I think it provides a really interesting way to approach the question of decolonizing and to think through the different kinds of knowledge um, that exist in, in these spaces in which we work. Um, I was interested just to start with questions of methodology, which I know are quite important to you and at the heart of what what you do. Um, this dynamic that you spoke about, this um, relationship with your participant as co-researcher, rather than the dynamic being, you know, the sort of aloof, um, removed uh, researcher, and then the participant who is a subject of, of study. So actually thinking about shifting those dynamics and having participants as co-researchers, how does that Effect as a, as as the kind of quote unquote researcher, how does that affect your presence or your contribution to the project? I.e., if there's the breaking down of those boundaries, how do you, as as an academic, um, figure within that research? I mean, do you find yourself more present in it, and and how does that impact the kinds of findings that you then that you then um, you know come to? Okay, um, you know. Um, thank you for, for, for that question. I think it might um, help to say a little bit more about social dream drawing, uh, but maybe also about how um, student leaders end up really enjoying the experience. Um, and then afterwards I go and have all the work to do to organize all the chaos that they give me. Um, but um, I mean, just in terms of the, the many rich, you know, ideas that they come up with, um, so let me say two things. First of all, um, when we do social dream drawing, um, except if it's online, um, so in a face-to-face -face setting, we, we sit in a circle. And I spoke about it a lot earlier on. Um, so, you know, it might even represent that, you know, in, in, in our context. So we sit in a circle um, and I assume a, a, a place in that circle. Um, so my, 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 you know, neither myself or the participants have a place of prominence. Um, and um, what I didn't explain maybe is that each student leader uh, takes a turn to present their dream drawing. Um, and the dream becomes then uh, part of the group's discussion or, or let me say the dream becomes the dream of the group when the dreamer then places their dream drawing in the middle of the circle that we're sitting in. So it becomes our dream. Um, but in terms of analysis or, or, or my role as a researcher, um, Number one, during the session, I have the role to help the participants to link the, the associations and, and the explorations that they have about the dream to the issues that they, the social issues that, that they might, you know, experience or be talking about and relating those associations that they're coming up with, with the experiences. So that's one level of analysis. Um, post the session, um, I would then sit and organize um, the themes with, um, in a way that many would recognize as, as a thematic analysis, um, and and you know group group the themes and and, and group uh, um, ideas that would probably go together, um, and and then a third step of 
data analysis would be then to take back my trying to organize um, everything that has happened in the group back to them um, and then confirming and in traditional research language, we might call that member checks. Um, so, so, so that is probably the familiar language that I might use um, to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we've got quite a few questions coming up in the chat, so I might just jump over to some of them. One of the questions were with relation to the um, images you showed, you showed of, uh, of, of some of the, the dreams um, um, that you analysed. Uh, the question is, were the pregnancy slash snake dreams experienced by men and women alike? Yes. So um, the, the, the 2014 stillborn dream was um, a dream uh, brought to the group by a, by a female student leader. And then the one next to it that I showed here um, was um, uh, brought to the group by a male student leader. And it was interesting for me that that was actually an SRC president. Um, that's something I haven't looked into yet, but um, you know, it's 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 coming up in my mind now. It's something very interesting to to think about further, um, just in terms of the prominence of male leadership, um, the place of um, you know the gender dynamics that come up when we speak about um, student leadership with the groups um, as the conversations go on. So. Yeah, there's actually something to to think about more there. Thanks, and then on on that on that sort of topic of, of thinking about the images that you presented, there's another question that asks, what do we currently project onto student leadership that makes taking up of their leadership roles so burdensome, so mm. rendering perceived mm. leadership outcomes as stillborn and lost? Mm. Yeah, you know, and then. Um, the frustrating thing for me, if I take things personal, is that, you know, when they protest, which I would say when they push back um, in terms of what we project on them, then we call the police on them. Um, and, and, and I mean, there are many issues that I am provoking right now when saying that, um, because you know there are issues about security and safety, and should we just let student leaders just go on a rant and you know? Um, but I am interested in thinking about this in terms of, but do we listen to them, and 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 could this be their way of? speaking to us because when they use words, we don't hear them. Um, which may have been one of the reasons why I may have chosen not to ask them questions. So, you know, in other words, speak, um, speak uh, 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 like in, in a hierarchical fashion or, you know, in a way that puts them in a, a, a subordinate type of position. Um, but then, you know, went towards such a methodology that gives them the power to bring what they want to bring to the conversation. Um, so I, I, I do believe that there might be quite a bit that we are not yet um, brave to confront and that um, ends up being, you know, carried by the student leaders, probably because the end of the, the chain. You know, and there's a question that, that's thinking about um, the potential for interdisciplinarity. Uh, I know this is something that we've spoken about, um, but the question asks, I was wondering if you could expand on your experiences of and perhaps hopes for inter and transdisciplinarity or perhaps for moving beyond disciplines, because of course, I mean, we've had conversations about mm -hmm. dreams, you know, in, in, in the arts um, and mm -hmm. what the relationship might be. Yeah, I mean, I am very um, certain that um, this kind of work um, is not just, a, uh, um, you know, boundary within psychology. 
Um, and when I read, the literature that I read spans into economics, into politics, and, you know, just like, my brain's too small to handle all of that. Uh, so um, I definitely wish that um, there would be more collaboration in terms of the studies of student leadership in um, a variety of contexts, but, you know, for my own selfish uh, wishes, you know, in my context, um, and definitely also crossing boundaries within psychology subdisciplines, you know, um, because I've seen, um, you know, there are mental health um, issues that come up, um, there are positive psychology issues that come up, there are um, psychodynamic issues that come up, there's industrial psychology issues that come up. So um, even within psychology, um, this type of work also spans, you know, across subdisciplines. So my 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 wish um, is is really to collaborate um, even beyond the humanities, um, you know, uh, so that we can really consolidate this field. Um, the student leadership field, um, especially in South Africa, is really fragmented. Um, as I've also, um, you know, discussed a little bit in the within the lecture, um, and and somehow I've, I I believe that the the fragmented uh, or the fragmentedness, which might also be a psychodynamic representation of what's going on, um, it, it, it is part of you know the 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 mess or our chaos that student leaders end up bearing the brunt of. Um, so um, I definitely believe that um, we, we, we can, we, there is a lot of opportunity for, for working across disciplines. I've never been somebody who, who, you know, even in preschool, I didn't color in inside the boundaries. I always went out, you know. So, so um, that's just, um, yeah, my thoughts on that. I like I like the I like the reference to your own uh, to your own drawing in this. It, it, it's a nice get us again get a sense of of um of you the researcher in this and and how you approach things. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question that that speaks to you know speaking a bit about this your discipline and how you've approached um your your research. We've had a question from someone in Brazil who says that we still primarily uh, primarily I think it's psychoanalyzed in psychology, including dream studies. And they would like to ask, um, why do you think that studying dreams became less valued and scientific in the global north? Hmm, maybe this takes me back to my very recent brutal, well, I experienced it as brutal, uh, brutal feedback from a journal um, review. Um, there's something about seeing uh, dreams or even the drawings and um, assigning some kind of, um, I don't know, um, illegitimacy uh, to it, you know, there is nothing, uh, maybe it's the unstructuredness of it, I don't know, you know, we like, and maybe it's worse than thought. Um, but we like our boxes and our structures and things that go from left to right in order, you know. Um, and and here, you know, um, even even the dimension of explorative is not as a phenomenology interview, you know. Um, so um, another thing that might be maybe a little bit. Uh, new to grasp about this method is that we don't interpret the dreams, um, and um, the 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 dream the dream uh, or working with the dream as you as you have seen. Um, while I was busy with this lecture, I noticed something else new um, about you know what was in front of me. I didn't realize that in 2014 we had seen the left side of the face and then in 2021, the right side of the face came up. And, you know, in my imagination, um, and that's where the journals, I begin to fight with the journals because now I can dream further 
than what is on the drawing and say, oh, it's possible that the snake bite was already there in 2014, you know? And so how do I prove that? Um, and, and I can't prove that. Um, it's my imagination, the possibility hypotheses that I am putting forward. Um, but the, 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 the wealth of letting your mind go and, and, and to think about how um, deep and wide and long and fluid and maybe long life that this data can give you um, is, 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 is not popular according to what we have um, decided is science. And my whole point of, of, of my, you know, ramble today is to say, but can we think about, um, you know, can we break boundaries in, in, in some ways and think afresh or think um, wider or more creatively about what we might call science. And if we are serious about saying we, we, we would like to include further than West in determining what is science, then are we ready to say what we have regarded as science may have not always been all that science is, you know? So, even in what I've presented, I've presented the African perspective, but there's so much more to the African perspective, I know in part. So in other words, what we think we know, we also don't know, you know? And there's so many things that we think we know, but we don't know. And knowledge creation is really about that, about extending what we think we know with what we didn't know before. And even at that moment, we still don't know everything. You know, so um, I'm trying to say, can we think wider and broader? And if if truly the 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 world is trying to look to Africa, um, you know, for 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 what they can contribute, then then I think we should be serious about um, opening up the gates of what is legitimate and what is not. But that that's a really that's a really important point and and I think the the idea that there are sites in which knowledge is um, the idea that there are parts of the world where knowledge exists and others where the knowledge is, is less valuable that kind of destabilizing of that I mean that's part of of you know what you spoke to in in terms of decolonizing and and making um, engaging with knowledge systems that have been largely ignored from kind of global thought. Um, I think that's such an important part of, of your work. Um, we've had a question that, that is thinking through um, the dream world's approach and, and asks if there are parallels uh, between evangelical practices in relation to mm -hmm. visions and extremist methods of group actions, motivations. Is that something that you've given any thought to? And, and again, thinking about how dreams figure in the in, in multiple African contexts. I wonder if um, Professor Noah's quote, when he said dreams are prophetic in nature or in content related to that. Um, so that might be an interesting, uh, you know, avenue to explore further. Um, I mean, at the same time, or maybe in addition, um, you know, African ontology is also about, you know, the spiritual basis um, of knowledge. So um, maybe there's something to, 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 to link to that. Um, I, 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 I do know about, you know, um, something that I've quoted also in the in the lecture about, you know, the students. Um, I mean, not the students. Somebody's distracting me on the chat. Um, the 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 Africans' commitment to the invisible. Um, so so, you know, I think that those things um, may link to 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 what the question is referring to. But definitely something that I'm going to look into. Um, than, than I have, yeah. 
And um, just again, thinking about the question of, of, of gyms in an African context, we have a, a question that, that references the um, like the proverb that you that you provided, the Khoisan understanding of of dreaming as as a collective. Um, and the question asks if you're familiar with Robin Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, which aims to surface a collective radical black dream. Hmm. So yeah, I'm, I mean, um, Franz Fanon spoke about the collective dream and the, and the unconscious dynamics about the dream to be white. Um, that was um, embedded in the pain that that um, you know resulting from racism. Um, so that that the reference to that book makes me think of that. And I suppose I think one of the things that I've, I'm wondering about is is the the kind of idea of the collective dream and where that sits with collective memory um, and 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 the relationship between potentially those those fields, but that might be for another, that might be for another day and for another conversation, but it has got me thinking about that. You know, the idea of what's stored in the subconscious. And right, what right. I mean, um, Rose Marisky speaks about uh, dreaming as thinking and that the drawing facilitates um, or is a vehicle to expose the thinking of the group. Um, so we might take, you know, the thinking um, as memory um, as well. Um, and um, according to the quote that I read by Susan Long, um, you know, she, 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 she's also advising us to look at these elements as conscious and unconscious um, dynamics. Um, so we, we might think of memory as quite a conscious, very, brain, you know, activity, uh, but memory can also be unconscious. Um, and somehow how these intergenerational um, dynamics are passed on. Thank you. And just um, jumping between Q&A and chat, so that's where my eyes are going. If anyone's wondering why my eyes are going back and forth. Um, so just to jump into one of the questions in the chat, um, one of the questions is, I found references to the temporal dimensions quite fascinating. On the one hand, references to Mandela, but also within your work and the kind of connections between um, 2014 and 2021. Um, this might be more of a comment, the weaving together, especially in the context of the fractured nature of the student movement you mentioned. So that's more of a, of a comment. Um, we have another... Um, person thanking you for your insights and taking yeah, dream yeah. interpretations to the next level of client-centered interventions in therapeutic settings. Um, and then there's some suggestions for works. Someone asks, are there any parallels or references to similar work from countries like China or India or Asia, um, knowing that their approach to psychology and methodology may differ from the Western countries? So there's a sort of comparative element that you might be aware of. And you know, I mean, I think this is probably linking to my disclaimer, you know, that African um, knowledge or even psychology is not new. And, you know, um, what I think about that is that at places, all these knowledges converge somewhere. You know, so we and 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 hence the comment about the clash and harmony. You know, so so um, I think they, they, there is value in um, helping ourselves to hold the two together and be a, being able to work with the two together, um, even if it may be uncomfortable. We we can be drawn to sameness. Um, you know. Um, for for the sake of um, you know in, not being in a, in a turbulent environment, but as much as we are the same, we are different, and those two things are beautiful together. 
Thank you. We have another question in the Q&A. Um, so Dr. Poulet, would you agree that there is convergence among African psychologies and classical psychotherapies in the interpretation of dreams as much as there is with others such as Eastern therapies? The difference may be in the actual draw drawings of social dream drawings in relation to inducing trance and drawing a mental picture. Um, maybe I should also say that um, the participants um, of social dream drawing draw their dreams um, where they are before the session. Um, so, so, so they bring the, so when they come to the session, um, the dreams are already drawn and, 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 and we, we get into the exploration of, I mean, the sharing of the dream and, and the associations to the drawing and all of that. So, so, um, I wouldn't know much about trans, um, but, what I will say is that um, I definitely believe that, um, I mean, this is how I could take a methodology that was developed um, in the UK, um, at a university in the UK or through a PhD in the UK um, by somebody who lives in Germany, who has um, some American ancestry and, you know, and, and, and drawn some resonance to it and say, well, this can work in the African context. So I think conversions, you know, is, is something that um, um, comes across quite clearly. Um, and, and definitely the symbolism would be then, you know, African symbolism that, that we would work with, um, without forgetting the, the blended nature um, that we have uh, because of the colonization that is in our, uh, 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 you know, psyche, in our work, the working of who we are, right? So some of the symbolism may not always be African symbolism, but I think that the African symbolism gives us very important information that we would that we, that we wouldn't get elsewhere, right? Um, so definitely that. Um, and I think that there's um, the wisdom about Africa and, 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 and what Africa can tell us about dreams that we can appreciate to these methodologies. And so today we're talking about dreams, but it could also be in medicine. You know, I've seen that there's a new university opening in South Africa on the use of cannabis. So therefore herbal medicine, right? So, so I think that, um, I'm, I'm talking about just referencing social dream drawing, but I think there's a lot more from Africa that the world can learn um, that definitely can resonate um, with the world. Thank you. And on, on that note, there's a there's a question that sort of picks up on some of the some of the, 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 the topics you were just speaking to there. And it's it's around the South African dreaming traditions in your work. How central are they? So it says, do any of the dream drawers also engage in plus visions and dreams. You cite Jung, but how important are South African or South South slash South African dreaming traditions for your work? Oh, maybe let me disclaimer. I cited Jung uh, to say that, well, we acknowledge that's where we started, but we've moved. Right. Um, and I think it is important to um, acknowledge those who came before us. Um, and, 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 you know, but my interest in, in the dreams or the dream drawings are about the group, uh, when you focused on the individual. Um, so I, I make that disclaimer. Um, and, um, we, 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 we are working with what the students, um, associate at that point in time during the group. So, um, I, Myself as the researcher, I don't bring a method of interpretation or association. So the group associates as 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 and has its own life um, in terms of of bringing the association. So if um, a particular association comes up, then we work with it. Um, but I I don't necessarily impose 
um, an association that probably takes us back to your question, the one, the first one that we started with. Yes, thank you. This has been a really, really rich discussion. I just have one eye on the clock as we have to round up soon. So if anyone has any more questions, please put them in the chat. I just also want to take a moment to convey all the messages that I'm not getting a chance to read out, but are just saying how amazing your work is, how wonderful it is. Um, there's also somebody who signals possibly a collaboration in Brazil. So I've made a note of that oh, for, you for later on. So I think this is, this is, um, I think the idea of the collective is also really coming through in this, mm -hmm. this discussion today. And lots of people are just very, very interested in what, in what you do. Um, Another question that's just come in. Uh, so this is a fantastic integration of African psychology and ontology with what we think of as European dreaming traditions, reowning African principles and reclaiming epistemology. Lots of lo lots and lots of thought for thought for thought and thinking about how to integrate this into global North thinking. And I think that's also a very important um, intervention you're making is you're sort of giving us, you're talking us through, providing us with ways of, of rethinking our own practices and actually challenging, as you said, what we already think we know and actually going to the root of it and questioning and questioning how we approach the research. And I think one of the things I found particularly just interesting about your work and, and also interesting about there was a moment in which you were contemplating retitling uh, the, the paper and moving away from potentially the decolonizing framework. And I just thought it was fascinating that not only is your work interested in student leaders who essentially are asking for or who are pushing for um, the decolonizing of the institution, um, but in you engaging in that kind of a, a research, you're also questioning methodologies. And so I think, and questioning kind of what can be quite colonial approaches. Um, so I think through and through to me, it was screaming decolonizing. And, and mm. so maybe maybe you want to speak to that, that particular tension. You did say to us that there might be some tensions that emerge. Do you want to speak just your ways of thinking through the work you're doing? Hmm. Do you have another hour? <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely find um, an, a seriously unintended um, outcome. Um, I thought that I was really, I mean, all the way in 2014, I thought I was just doing a PhD, um, you know, selfish ambition of uh, if I can say the Western way of thinking, and then I really just ended up in the middle of um, advocacy, which is natural um, to me. So, um, and I also ended up with um, social dream drawing uh, by chance, but my attraction to it because I'm a dreamer myself. Um, so, um, I, 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 I think about this as really uh, work that integrates my identity as a professional. So, you know, as a counseling psychologist, as somebody who wants to um, advocate for, 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 you know, the place of student leaders in, in, in the work that they do in the university, but then also how we take care of them. So, our responsibility as psychologists um, in terms of that, because how we train students even till today and how I was trained is to be this reactive professional who waits for people to come to them, you know, and somehow the student leadership work is, is requiring of psychologists to actually take a step towards, you know, and somehow be proactive um, in, in, in the work of supporting them. Um, so it, it really integrates, um, you know, different um, pieces of, 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 of my needs and, and, and um, natural inclinations, but then also the things that keep me awake, you know, are we being just? Um, so, um, and then definitely as a researcher, but then also as somebody who's just never stayed within the lines, you know. Um, so I'm always asking questions. I'm always challenging myself. I'm always challenging the system. Um, and, and I think that we need to ask these difficult questions and 
um, and, tr and keep at making sense of all these different parts that don't always make sense, but keep thinking about, about it, you know. Um, I feel like if I had a straight answer, I'll say to you that I've arrived. Um, and so I'm not giving you a straight answer because I haven't arrived, you know, and there are all these different pieces um, that, that need um, thought, you know, on, on many cycles. You know, so, but I mean, it's very interesting work for me. Um, and I enjoy, I enjoy it because one day I'm thinking about methodology, the other day I'm thinking about justice, the other day I'm thinking about our responsibility for mental health. Um, so it's keeping me busy. Thank you for that. I think that's probably a, a nice place to, 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 to round up our conversation, but thank you once again for you so much. Um, all the effort and time that you've put into preparing this lecture and for being with us this evening and answering a range of, of really thought-provoking questions. And, um, yeah. you just, did you want to say any final, any final? Yes, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here and just taking the time to, 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 to be here and see, you know, what the student leaders are dream, dreaming about um, and listening to, to my blurb. And I'm just, not not a blurb at all, but just really, really mm -hmm. rich food for thought. And I'm going to just hand over to to Carly. I don't know if Carly wants to say some some closing remarks on behalf of ASA UK. Carly, thank you very much, Nir. And I'm sorry to hear that your work keeps you awake. Uh, because you need to dream. <laughs> Thank you for a fantastic lecture. Um, and I can't wait to watch it again when it's on YouTube. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Carly. <laughs> so I think we're going to stop recording now. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for coming.